Hey there, welcome back to the Fully Live Athlete Pastor channel. This is Justin again speaking, and we are on uh, the Online Bible Reading Club series, day 154. Uh, we're going to be going through this uh, Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, with a little bit of Old, a little bit of New Testament each and every day. And there's a review, a preview clip that we do, a commentary for each reading. And so that's what we're looking at today. We're looking at the uh, Old Testament, uh, 2 Chronicles 19 and 20, chapters 19 and 20. And we're going to be looking at John 13, 21 through 38. So a short reading in the New Testament. Okay, as you're looking at John 13, we'll start there in the New Testament today. And we'll... we'll flip back to the Old Testament, but uh, it's a great reading. As you look at it, you're seeing a couple of important uh, stories, uh, and we'll highlight that the big theme of this 13th chapter is the love of God, right, in Christ. Christ is loving his disciples by laying down his life, and that's pictured in the washing of the feet, which we read about in the previous episode. But as you see that this chapter closes out, he says, I'm going to leave you, uh, in a little while, only a little longer. He calls them little children in verse 33, right? Little children, yet a little while I'm with you, and you will seek me, um, and, uh, but uh, where I'm going you cannot come. So he says, a new commandment I give you, and he says that in verse 34, uh, that you love one another, uh, just as I've loved you. You also love one another. By this, it says in verse 35, people will know that you're my disciples if you love, if you have love for one another, if you uh, love one another. So, love one another. Now, a lot of Christians take these words and sort of misunderstand what the point of it is, right? Uh, some churches and Christians will want to say, well, see, that just, uh, that just breaks it down. What Jesus cares about is our loving people. Absolutely, he does. Absolutely. And they want to, but they want to minimize doctrine and say, all that really matters is we love one another, right? Loving people. So love, love is the big thing uh, of religion. Actually, no. That is not it. Uh, now, and what they want to do is sort of, uh, and they're, they're, a lot of churches will say, hey, uh, really they're, they're just evangelism factories, and so everything's evangelism driven. Everything's about the mission of convincing and converting the world. And yeah, that's a very important thing too. So loving people, evangelism, and so they read this and they think, well, okay, so we need to preach always, but if necessary, uh, use words. So it's saying, hey, by the love that we show to people, we are going to bring them to Christ. People are going to be compelled and convinced to love Christ because of our love that they see uh, from our actions, right? Absolutely not true. That's not what Jesus is saying here. It says, by your love for one another, they will know you're my disciples. Now, what does that mean? Now, is this a positive thing or a negative thing for us? Well, actually, the, the early church discovered this was a very dangerous proposition, right? Uh, the early church was being hunted down. Uh, there were no public uh, seeker-sensitive uh, worship services. There were no seekers. Well, the only people seeking them were were seeking to kill them. So they had to like guard uh, the the worship services uh, and the church uh, meetings uh, from outsiders because uh, there would be spies who would tell the governing authorities and they would crack down and kill them. And that's throughout the world. Uh, you see that today all over the world. Church uh, members and followers of Christ are killed and mistreated. I get a, a magazine in the mail uh, each and every week from Voice of the Martyrs uh, telling stories about persecuted Christians throughout the world. Uh, Christians who are martyred, Christians who lose everything, have to give up everything, they are kicked out of their communities for being followers of Christ. It says, by this, by your love for one another, the people will know that you are my disciples. Now, and what does that mean? It means they will kill you. They do not want Jesus. They are against Jesus. See, this is a basic doctrine from the from the from all of Scripture, is that the heart is desperately wicked. Who can understand? The heart is set against God. And this is what makes the love that Jesus has for these people so amazing. He is uh, completely set on loving, forgiving, atoning for the sinners that are his, his disciples. And he loves them to the uttermost. His commitment to them is unwavering. There is no love you will ever experience from another human being like the love that Jesus has for his people here. And he's saying, you're going to love each other in that never letting go, covenantal, committed love where you're going to sacrifice and give for one another. And you know what? The world will find that to be utterly uh, unique, uh, but despicable. 
They will hate your love based uh, uh, upon Christ and his love for you uh, and that you will share with other Christians. They will not want it. They will uh, not find it to be compelling uh, because their hearts are set against Jesus and they hate him. The world hates God. And that, again, is why the love of Jesus is amazing. And, and they will identify you with this love. They'll see this love that you have for your church and for other believers uh, because you love Christ. And they love Christ and they will hate you. That is the bottom line. So this is not an evangelism strategy. This is not a watering down of commandments, just love. No, it's, it's love God by loving his commandments and loving all of, all of his revealed will and his law. Uh, and that's how you're going to demonstrate your love for each other. You're going to uh, care about truth and honoring your, your brother's name. All, in, all, all the ways that, uh, that you love, uh, the, the world that we live in today in America is very much, uh, uh, you know, like truth is sort of uh, yeah, use it, uh, used uh, when it's convenient and people find ways to sort of run everybody down uh, and not care about reputations and, and loving people. Uh, and their own and their neighbor's reputation. So that's just one example exactly. So as you look at this, the love that you have is going to be so weird, uh, and uh, it will be genuine, but it will also put you in the crosshairs for hatred, as uh, as Jesus says, uh, they hated me, uh, so they will hate you, uh, because you're in me. Now, and you see that as evidence in Peter's, uh, the last uh, three verses of this chapter, and as Peter says to the Lord, Jesus, where are you going? And then Jesus says, where I'm going, you cannot follow me. But you will follow afterward. Meaning, uh, I will be killed uh, today. Uh, it's coming, or tomorrow. I will be killed, and you will be, uh, you will follow later. You will deny me three times tonight. He predicts the denial of Peter there uh, before the rooster crows. Uh, you will deny me three times. And that's how the chapter closes. So, uh, you will be hated because the world hates me. In fact, uh, Peter realizes that he puts himself in the crosshairs, uh, and so he is intimidated uh, and three times denies it even knows Jesus. Uh, you'll see that uh, coming up. But hey, with that said, let's go back to the uh, Old Testament reading, and you see uh, a very significant king in uh, Israel's history. As you look at the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, uh, it's been a bad, uh, bad thing because Jehoshaphat, has uh, entered into alliance with the northern kingdom, which is godless. And so you see the very beginning of the chapter, in uh, chapter 19, that uh, one of the prophets uh, comes out and, and berates the king for his uh, compromise, you know, and in uh, that area. And so you see uh, ominous tones of, you know, Jehoshaphat is overall a very strong, uh, godly uh, reformer. In fact, as you see, that's the big heading chapter in my Bible there about the reforms he made. But you see at the, at the final, final tally is that he didn't do uh, all that he could do, and he didn't get rid of uh, the, uh, the idolatrous worship in the land fully. Uh, you see that at the end of verse 3, his, his reforms were not wholehearted. Is that's, the, that's the evaluation there. But nonetheless, some really amazing content to look at and dig into on this. I want to just highlight a, a few verses uh, in it, uh, if you would allow me to, to just read a couple of places, uh, particularly verses 12 and 15. In the context of chapter 20, verses 12 and 15, is there's a massive horde of nations who are converging upon Jerusalem to destroy them. Now, you're staring down a horde as the king of an undersized uh, nation, and, and it is going to be disaster for you. Everything that you know, everything you live, uh, live for and love and and your people will be uh, taken into slavery. Uh, women will be uh, raped for potentially. Your, everything that you love and your and your temple will be pillaged. Uh, it is going to be ugly uh, if if something doesn't happen. So here's what here's what um, Jehoshaphat's uh, assessment of it is in verse 12. It says, "O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them?" He says. For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That is a wonderful statement of how powerless you and I can feel uh, in our day-to-day -day lives, especially when we're dealing with massive problems that we simply can't fix. Uh, and when you have uh, a massive horde of people who hate God and hate all things that represent God, uh, and, and they're coming to get you, uh, you have a problem. 
and, and, and the Lord, and he says, uh, will you not execute judgment? That's our prayer. Uh, will you not execute judgment, Lord? Will you, will you vindicate your people? Will you not do that? And so we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We look to the Lord. That's what, that's what it is. And see, look at uh, 15. He also says, listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King, uh, uh, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed at this great horde for the battle is not yours, but God's. Uh, again, the battle is not yours, but it is God's. He uh, encourages people. So he prays to God. He encourages people uh, that the Lord has given this land uh, to the descendants of Abraham because of his covenant promises. And it's up to the Lord to defend it. And, and that is the bottom line. The Lord keeps his word and he defends his word. So he trusts in the Lord and relies upon him. The battle is the Lord's. And, and again, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Uh, and you see that the Lord sets an ambush uh, and they don't have to do a single thing. The Lord literally uses others to do his work to defend the people and to keep his covenant promises to Jehoshaphat. So very good news. Uh, you see here that Jehoshaphat, though not a perfect example again of Jesus, uh, fits uh, the king stereotype or the, the king type of Jesus by trusting in the Lord to defend him, just as Jesus in John 13 trusts in the Lord and says, Judas Iscariot, go and do what you must. For the Lord will glorify uh, himself today in me uh, and through his uh, death would actually glorify the Lord because it bring the accomplishment of redemption for his people. And all the promises that were in Abraham and in the nation of Israel would come to fruition on that day on the cross and then on Sunday at the, Lord, at the Lord's resurrection. So with that said, I hope you've enjoyed the reading. We'll see you next time on All in Bed Reading Club. Take care. Leave a comment. Like if you like, if you like it. And we'll keep on rolling. Thanks. Take care.